Good morning and welcome. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first international conference in neuroscience and pharmacology organized by the University of Latvia, Faculty of Medicine and the Latvian Society of Pharmacology. The aim of this conference is to exchange the latest findings in neurogen neurodegeneration uh, research, but not only this, it is also about bridging research doing, being done in the Baltic countries with the research of collaborators um, in the United States and in other European countries. The Dean of the University of uh, Latvia Faculty of Medicine unfortunately is um, not present today, but she is sending um, her regards and wishes um, a successful collaboration between us. Um, but also I want to mention that this event wouldn't be possible without the support, without the support of the Baltic American Freedom Foundation, which is committed to strengthening um, the ties between the United States and the Baltic countries. And we are very pleased to enjoy the support from the companies Genmedica, Grindex, Adrona, and UFAR. We, um, this is a very important event for us and the University of Latvia. And it's about time to start to play a more significant role um, in the growing field of Renaissance science. We, the organizers, hope you will have um, fruitful and enjoyable conference which will bring more successful future collaboration. Thank you. And now I will give the stage to our rector of the University of Latvia, Mārcis Auziņš. Please. Good morning. Dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, dear guests of the, of the University of Latvia, I am very happy to welcome all of you for the opening of the conference about uh, neuroscience and pharmacology and for the opening at the large aula of the University of Latvia. Uh, as far as I see many guests of our university today in the audience, uh, maybe I can give you a very brief introduction to the University of Latvia. The uh, University of Latvia was founded in 1919. Uh, for European scale, it sounds like not very old university. Uh, but actually, I can uh, tell you that the University of Latvia cannot be older than that, because it was founded uh, a couple of months after the independent country was founded. It was founded as the first uh, national educational institution in Latvia for higher education and first uh, research institution in uh, Latvia. So it means that our age is the same as uh, the age of our country. If we are speaking about uh, size of the university, uh, students, researchers, staff, altogether we are around uh, 20,000 people. Again, for European scale, sounds like not a very large university. But if I'm willing to impress my uh, guests, what I'm trying to do now, uh, I can tell that we are almost 1% of current population of Latvia. Uh, it tells something about university, of course it tells something ab about country as well, we are not a very large country, but definitely it tells what kind of role we are, we are playing in our society. We are not only research institution, we are not only educational institution, we are also a um, kind of um, intellectual center of our um, country. And I believe that your conference is one uh, part of this intellectual activity because neuroscience, ph pharmacology, of course, it's very specific uh, research area, but of course it's an area which is uh, important for a society in general. 
if you are speaking about uh, current situation in the Western world, we are an aging society, we know that, and I think that all these issues which you will be discussing today are important not only for professionals, but are important for society in uh, general. So I uh, hope that you will have very, fru very fruitful professional discussions, but that you will have also this outreach for, the so for society in general, and the uh, message which you will be uh, telling us will be heard not only among professionals, but, but for society in uh, general. I wish you very uh, fruitful uh, discussions, very many uh, interesting and uh, important talks from this podium, but actually uh, one of my wishes will be maybe not very traditional. I wish you very uh, many long coffee breaks. And this actually is a message with, with, with some meaning, because those of us who are going for uh, research conferences, we know that very often uh, very important discussions are happening not during the uh, lectures, but during the coffee breaks. Because during the coffee breaks, uh, people are more open, sometimes willing to uh, propose ideas which are not formulated in the final stage, not ready for presentation conference, but they have some, some, some powers, some, some uh, possibilities to be developed in new projects and new ideas. I hope very much that these discussions will be happening. I hope very much that during these discussions maybe some new uh, friendships will be established, maybe some ideas from, for a new uh, joint projects and new collaborations will be started. And if uh, this will be happening as the rector of the university, I will be uh, more than happy. So I wish you very interesting uh, conference, and I hope that you will have time also to enjoy our beautiful city, Riga. In springtime, it's especially beautiful, so have a nice time in Riga. Thank you. And now, please uh, welcome Ilza Doshkina, the Regional Director of Baltic American Freedom Foundation. Good morning, uh, Rector Ausinc, uh, dear participants, uh, colleagues and friends. We Latvians like to call ourselves people who sing, or this is a land uh, where we sing. Uh, Baltic American Freedom Foundation, we think that Latvians are people who like to study, who like to intern, go for exchange programs, and then return and uh, make things done. And uh, I recall around four years ago, we were interviewing a young Latvian ambitious motivated scientist for one of our internship uh, programs. And uh, as you can imagine, that was Ulrika. And uh, who uh, could ever guess that in four years I will be standing here in front of you and uh, addressing a neuroscience uh, conference. And uh, it is exactly our mission, as Ulrika already mentioned, it is to strengthen the ties between United States and the Baltic States through education and, uh, and different kind of exchange programs. Our new uh, dialogue program, which is uh, under which we're uh, supporting this conference, is exactly a dialogue. So I wish you a, a good dialogue, not starting today, but co continuing, and uh, good luck with your conference, and I'm almost sure that Ulrika also sings. Thank you. And now the first session can start, and um, our session chairs, Maya Dombro and Thomas Van Groen, are welcome to join. And the first speaker will be also announced. The first speaker of the session and the first speaker of the meeting will be Harry Finters, a famous neuropathologist from UCLA. Here. Okay, can I just advance here? Great. Thank you, uh, Thomas. 
ir lielis būt atpakaļ Latvijā, man ir vec vecāk ir no Jelgavas rajona, tā kā es neesmu bijis Latvijā kādus 5-6 gadus. Uh, I should say that the pathologist usually gets the last word or is one of the last speakers in any scientific session, so this is um, turned around, so I'm the first speaker and I'm very proud of that. Uh, and I may, might even have a few minutes of bonus time, although my talk is about 20 or 22 minutes in length. I especially want to thank Ulrika for, uh, for organizing this meeting, having organized a couple of meetings over the years. I know that it's a huge amount of work and there's massive effort that goes behind the scenes in making it successful, so many thanks to her and her organizing committee. Uh, and then finally, thanks to BAF and the other supporters of the meeting. Uh, BAF, of course, not only is supporting this meeting, but they supported a period of study for Ulrika in my laboratory, which was very productive uh, and extremely enjoyable to, to have her uh, there. My perspective on Alzheimer's disease and neurodegenerative diseases is obviously as a neuropathologist. My training is in neurology initially and neuropathology, but in practice I uh, work on neuropathology and do very little clinical neurology. Uh, and um, so my perspective really is from studying human tissues. I would say about 95% of my work and publications over the years have involved human tissues or human tissue-derived cell lines. We do a little bit of transgenic animal model work, but we never actually construct, unlike uh, Inga and Thomas, we never actually uh, breed or construct the transgenic or knockout animals, but we do collaborate with people who do. Uh, and we uh, work with them on that. So it's really, my studies are human tissue based and that's what I'm going to talk about. I was wondering if I can get the, just the two top lights out because I have a lot of spe specimens to show, a lot of histologic slides to show. If that's possible, fine, and if not, that's okay as well. This is always the first slide I show to give a perspective on neuropathologic approaches to not just neurodegenerative disease, but any disease. Uh, but in the case of cognitive impairment and an Alzheimer's disease, the clinical syndrome we encounter is that of memory impairment in an individual, cognitive decline, focal motor or sensory deficits, and profound personality changes over the full course of the disease. Uh, the patient dies and comes to autopsy. We occasionally do biopsies on people with cognitive impairment, or we sometimes do what I, I would call incidental biopsies. In other words, uh, a biopsy is done or a, a brain, uh, brain uh, segment resection is done not pur purposely to do the biopsy, but we can make the diagnosis in the tissue in any event. But at the time of autopsy, we document cortical atrophy, synaptic and dendritic loss, and I'm sure there will be speakers who will talk in great depth about this. We find senile plaques, neurofibrillary tangles, and amyloid angiopathy of varying degrees in the brain. Uh, microglial and astrocytic activation, uh, and then very often microvessel mediated ischemic changes, and I'll talk a little bit about those because they are probably extremely important and underestimated in, in age-related cognitive impairment, especially in individuals over the age of 80 or 85 years of age. And we make the assumption that those neuropathologic abnormalities explain the, the cognitive impairment and the personality change. Well, that, that's a very big leap, it's a very big jump, because we're examining the brain at one point in time uh, and at, a, at an end stage of the disease. So we're really looking at the tombstones of the disease and trying to infer how they produced cognitive impairment earlier on. So obviously one of the goals of modern Alzheimer's disease research is to image the abnormalities uh, prior to the patient's death. Oh, that's perfect, that's excellent. Thank you very much, that's great. Uh, so we... Um, we hope to image those, and we are more and more successful at imaging those abnormalities, and then we can compare them with what we see at autopsy. Nevertheless, uh, to turn it around, many of the abnormal proteins that we've found and have studied in Alzheimer's disease uh, and other neurodegenerative diseases, especially the frontotemporal lobar degenerations, were first discovered in autopsy material. So the autopsy observations, especially beginning in the 1960s and 70s, have really uh, guided the basic biochemical and genetic studies of Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is a very, very big problem. These are figures for the United States. Alzheimer's disease is by far the most prevalent neurodegenerative disorder. It is estimated to afflict about five to five and a half million individuals. Parkinson's disease, by contrast, about half a million to a million individuals. ALS is thankfully a relatively rare disorder 
And then the frontotemporal lobar degenerations are probably about two log orders less common than Alzheimer's disease. I put a question mark in front of that because uh, frontotemporal lobar degenerations often present as neuropsychiatric disorders and it's quite possible that many people will go through the full course of a frontotemporal lobar degeneration never actually having been, been diagnosed with the disorder uh, and don't have an autopsy. So uh, the, the, it's questionable. There may actually be more frequent cases of FTLD than, uh, than is now estimated. But right now it's thought to be about 1% of the cases. 1% as common as Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is going to become a bigger problem. Uh, why? Because the major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is getting old. And we have incredible medical advances now, certainly in cardiothoracic surgery, vascular re or cardiac revascularization procedures that keep individuals alive, certainly into their uh, 90s and 100s. Uh, and so uh, Alzheimer's disease is going to become more and more prevalent. This is an estimate of the US population bar graphs for uh, the number of elderly individuals, elderly being defined as over 80, 85, 90, or 95 years of age. And you can see that the red bar is the most rapidly, one of the most rapidly increasing. Uh, that 90, 95, 100 uh, year old individuals will become more and more common in society, and therefore at great risk for Alzheimer's disease. Um, until about five years ago, I had never performed an autopsy on anyone over 100 years of age. But in the last uh, four years, we've done about 15 autopsies on centenarians, including four autopsies on super centenarians, individuals who are more than 110 years of age. So it's rather a sobering statistic, and virtually all of them had Alzheimer's disease. I'm going to talk a little bit about, give somewhat of a historical perspective on uh, neuropathology contributions to dementia research. I hope it doesn't turn into a hysterical perspective. I once gave a talk on historical perspectives and one of my laboratory people said it actually was more on hyster hysterical perspective on the uh, field. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, as you know, was first described in 1906, so it's been known for about 109 years. Uh, and in the early 1900s, there were classic descriptions of Alzheimer's disease neuropathology. Uh, using routine and silver impregnation techniques that really demonstrated all of the microscopic abnormalities we now know are typical of this disease. And I still have some reprints in my file from 1910, 1912, not that I was working at that period, but they're historical papers, and the, the presentation of the lesions was extremely accurate. And the, uh, of course, this was long before the day of, days of photomicrographs. They were all drawings of the abnormalities. In the 1960s and 70s, there were correlative clinical pathologic studies that established Alzheimer's disease as the commonest cause of dementia. And the two papers I always cite as being extremely crucial in this area were the uh, papers written by Blessed Tomlinson and Roth in 1968 and 1970. They were the simplest studies you could imagine. Uh, one of them was called Observations on the Brains of Demented Old People, and the other one was called Observations on the Brains of Non-Demented Old People. Uh, what Blessed Tomlinson and Roth did, one of them was a neuropathologist, one was a psychiatrist, and one was a neurologist. They studied patients in a nursing home in Newcastle on Tyne in England. Uh, they followed them very carefully, examined them very carefully to a very close time before their death. Uh, and then got autopsies on these individuals. And they asked the question, what is the difference between the individuals who were demented and those who were not demented? And their expectation, their hypothesis going into the study was that they would find an overwhelming degree of stroke or ischemic change or encephalomalacia in the brains of the demented patients. But instead they found to their surprise that they were finding Alzheimer's disease. Now there was a certain amount of vascular comorbidity um, which is of interest because we now are refocusing our attention to microvascular abnormalities and how they might contribute to Alzheimer's disease and I know Inga and Thomas will talk about that. There were some immunohistochemical and electron microscopic approaches to looking at Alzheimer's disease lesions. The famous papers of Michael Kidd in the 1960s showing the paired helical filament structure of uh, neurofibrillary tangles. And the immunohistochemical studies were really not very hypothesis-driven. It was just an example of taking immunoreagents off the shelf and seeing if they immunolabeled any of the lesions of Alzheimer's disease. So that changed in the 1980s, uh, but I'll talk about just a little bit about the general neuropathology of Alzheimer's disease. 
So this is a very simple picture of a cognitively, a brain from a cognitively impaired, a cognitively normal individual on the left. This is a lateral view of the brain and a coronal section of the brain. My, the people in my lab when I show this always tell me I shouldn't say normal brain because a normal brain is usually not sitting in formal and then sitting in a bucket somewhere. Uh, but it's from the brain of somebody who has no neurologic abnormalities and you can see the cortical um, integrity is normal, Tempor all the lobes are fine, everything looks good. Uh, the ventricles are very, very, very tiny. By contrast, this is the brain of an Alzheimer's disease patient showing diffuse cortical atrophy with relative sparing of the cerebellum in the brain stem. And the cerebellum is almost always spared except in the familial, the genetically determined forms of Alzheimer's disease relating, re resulting from ATP or PS1 mutations uh, where there is usually profound cerebellar pathology. And the atrophy is overwhelming in the hippocampi but also involves the neocortex and the subcortical white matter and there is ventriculomegaly. And there are imaging paradigms now using high resolution MRI um, in which the hippocampal volume can be measured quite accurately and it can be used as a guide, as a surrogate guide, as a biomarker for who is likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And we just uh, have a, had a paper that came out where we did very high resolution imaging of a post-mortem hippocampi and compared those with the histopathology using seven Tesla imaging over about 48 hours. Uh, but you can get quite accurate imaging of the hippocampus um, anti-mortem uh, and look at and quantify the enlargement of the lateral ventricles and the degree of cortical atrophy as well. You'll notice that there is there are abnormalities of the white matter as well, and it's always been um, it's always been debated whether those white matter abnormalities are a separate disease entity. Um, it's very famous studies from Sweden by Arne Brown and Elizabeth England in the 1980s or whether they simply represent downstream degeneration because what's going, of what's going on in the cortex. And you can certainly find tau abnormalities in the axons of the white matter, so it's still kind of an open question, and I'm sure Inga will address that and Thomas will address that. Uh, this is the hippocampal formation where we focus a lot of our uh, time and effort um, because we know that the Alzheimer's disease changes begin in the transendorhinal cortex, uh, and then progress to the hippocampal formation and then progress to the neocortex. So we present, we, we spend a disproportionate amount of time looking at the hippocampal formation. And that's also of interest because the hippocampus is very vulnerable to anoxic ischemic changes. So that we know that in elderly individuals there can be what we interpret as ischemic changes in the hippocampus that certainly contribute to the cognitive impairment, but especially the memory storage and retrieval in an individual. So hippocampal ischemic lesions or destructive lesions are extremely important. And hippocampus is probably an understudied, uh, understudied structure in even post-mortem human brain, because we generally take one or two random sections of the hippocampus, usually at the level of the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is illustrated here. But front of fact, the, the hippocampal formation really runs several centimeters. And we've found in studies, this is mainly with Chris Zarrow at USC and other collaborators, that the more you look, the more carefully you look at the hippocampus, the more abnormalities that you find that may contribute to cognitive impairment. And I know there are different functions in the anterior versus the posterior hippocampal formation. This is one of the lesions that we obsess on. It's the senile plaque. This area, and you can see it on an H and E stained section, this irregularity in the cortex kind of unusual neuronal processes and what looks like globular, globular eosinophilic protein deposited in the cortex. Uh, here's a beautiful amyloid plaque, uh, the spectacular presence of an amyloid core and then probably a neuritic component to the plaque, another senile plaque here. So you can see these quite easily on H&E, uh, but we can see them more easily on uh, immunostain sections, which I'll show you and many other speakers will show you. This is the lesion that I call the forgotten lesion of Alzheimer's disease. It's found only in the hippocampus. It's a granulovacuolar degeneration, and granulovacuolar degeneration is thought to represent an abnormality of, of autophagy in neurons in the hippocampal formation, uh, but no one really knows how it contributes to the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's disease, and we've kind of been blinded by the abnormalities in the neocortex and have kind of ignored granulovacuolar degeneration, but it's a very real phenomenon and almost certainly leads to neuronal dysfunction in many individuals. 
And we can highlight these lesions the way people have been doing since the early 1900s using a silver stain. This happens to be a modified Bilshovsky technique. And all these little dots that you can see in the hippocampal formation are senile plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. And you can see some here in the parahippocampal cortex as well. And if we look at these at a higher magnification, which we always do, always ask a pathologist, do you want to see a higher magnification? The answer is always yes. Uh, this is a silver stained section showing beautifully the neurofibrillary tangles highlighted by the arrows. And the normal neurons here are the ones that are really unstained. And notice that there are these fibrils in the background, which are also silver positive. And those are neuropil threads or the processes of tangle bearing neurons. And again, I'll mention the pioneering studies of Michael Kidd who showed that these neurofibrillary tangles, when you look at them with the electron microscope, are comparative, uh, composed of very characteristic paired helical filaments or bifilar helices, which are typical of the NFTs. This is an important microvascular lesion in Alzheimer's disease. There are two main age-related microvascular lesions that occur in the brain. One is arteriolosclerosis and the other is amyloid angiopathy. And amyloid angiopathy can be highlighted using a Congo red stain uh, and polarizing the section and that yields this characteristic yellow-green birefringence. That's a non-specific feature of all amyloids. You can study any amyloid using the Congo red technique and it will show this same feature of uh, apple green birefringence when you uh, turn the prism, this is under polarized light when you turn the prism by about, uh, when you turn the polarizing um, uh, filters about 90 degrees. You'll notice that there's something interesting here as well, and that is that there's a senile plaque immediately adjacent to this small blood vessel. And there have been, uh, there's been a lot of interest over the years that the senile plaques may have something to do with capillary abnormalities, or to put it more correctly, that a subset of senile plaques might have something to do with capillary abnormalities. So certainly not all plaques are uh, adjacent to capillaries, but capillary abnormalities might be important in some of the senile plaques. And we do occasionally see amyloid involving capillaries as well. Amyloid angiopathy is a lesion near and dear to my heart because I've been studying it one way or another for about uh, 30 years, 32 years. This is actually a case of amyloid angiopathy in, in the brain section stained with beta amyloid, and you can see that there is a penetrating vessel here. Here are the meninges, here's the cortex. Penetrating vessel here, but you'll notice something very, very bad going on here, and that is the presence of a very, uh, fairly large microaneurysm. Uh, this was somebody with a familial Alzheimer's disease. I think it was related to an APP mutation, and this individual had overwhelming amyloid angiopathy, and it actually developed small aneurysms in the brain and had developed microhemorrhages in the brain. So this yellow pigment is uh, altered blood pigment, uh, and there were small bleeds throughout the brain related to extremely severe uh, amyloid angiopathy. So the brown immunoreactive material <clears throat> here is beta amyloid. The yellow material is altered blood pigment. So to review the key microscopic lesions of Alzheimer's disease, the granulovacular degeneration, the neurofibrillary tangles, the senile plaques, and the amyloid angiopathy. These lesions are all very widely distributed throughout the neocortex and the hippocampus, whereas granulovacular degeneration is pretty well confined to the hippocampal formation. It turns out all of these are amyloid. If you, using the classical histochemical definition of amyloid, if you stay in a section with Congo red and polarize it, you will see yellow-green birefringence, and that's true of the neurofibrillary tangles, the, the uh, amyloid in plaques, and the amyloid angiopathy. One of my mentors when I was in training, uh, Mel Ball, who's since retired, uh, when he wanted to count neurofibrillary tangles, never used a silver stain. He always used Congo red and polarized the sections because he said it was a better, more accurate portrayal of the neurofibrillary tangles. So in the 1980s and 90s, everything changed. Uh, with the, 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 the paradigm of Alzheimer's disease research, or the holy grail of Alzheimer's disease research, was to try to isolate the lesions of Alzheimer's disease and to study them in pure biochemical form. And uh, many people tried this. They tried to isolate senile plaques, neurofibrillary tangles. The person who sort of won that context was uh, George Glenner, a biochemist at University of California, San Diego, and his postdoc, Kane Wong. And in 1984, they characterized what they called the A4 protein 
uh, what we now call the beta amyloid, but they isolated it not from senile plaques or neurofibrillary tangles. Neurofibrillary tangles don't contain A beta, but they isolated it from meningeal amyloid-laden vessels. So this was their great technological advance, was to look at the very superficial blood vessels in the meninges and to characterize them using, um, using uh, biochemical techniques. And they characterized what we now call the A4 or beta amyloid protein. And as soon as the partial sequence of that protein was published, a number of laboratories made uh, antibodies to the A beta protein, or what was then called the A4 protein. And lo and behold, when you stained histologic sections uh, with an immunoperoxidase technique using the A beta antibodies, or, or, or antibodies to a synthetic protein representing portions of the A beta, you labeled not only C amyloid angiopathy, which you would expect, but also the senile plaques. And there were some early reports suggesting that you also were able to stain neurofibrillary tangles. That turned out not to be uh, accurate over time. And this is similar to Dr. Glenner's initial preparation. Amyloid-laden arterioles stained. This is a cytospin preparation stained with Congo red, and it, these showed spectacular yellow-green birefringence when they were polarized. Uh, we, he isolated them from the meninges, but we subsequently isolated them from the cerebral cortex and got the same result that he did, that we, f we found presence of the A beta or A4 protein within these vessels, not surprisingly. These are the two classic papers that um, Glenner and Wong published. One was on Alzheimer's disease and one was on uh, Down syndrome, and they showed that the A4 or A beta protein in the amyloid-laden vessels was the same. Um, and the explanation for that came when we discovered the first, when we, when others discovered the first APP mutations that cause familial, some cases of familial Alzheimer's disease. The story is that uh, Glenner tried to publish this work in Science, and the editors of the journal Science just kind of laughed at it. So he published it in what, what would have been considered a, a lower level journal, BBRC, still a very good biochemical journal. And of course, they've gone on to be two of the most cited papers in the history of that uh, journal, been cited thousands of times. Um, at about the same time, but at, about a year later, uh, Colin Masters, who had been trying to isolate senile plaques, was able to finally isolate the amyloid plaque core protein from an Alzheimer's disease and Down syndrome brains, and found, again, that it was composed of the A4 protein, or what we now call beta amyloid. And the beautiful, anti the spectacular antibodies have been made, and there are now numerous commercial antibodies available to A-beta, and they show the senile plaques uh, immunoreactive in these two panels. Uh, and this is actually a, an image from the cerebellum of, an, of a patient with uh, Down syndrome, showing that there is actually A-beta in the cere cerebellar cortex as well uh, as in the neocortex. Um, so, but the cerebellum generally tends to be uninvolved in Alzheimer's disease, except in people with uh, APP or presenilin mutations and Down syndrome patients, where there's very widespread uh, A-beta deposition in the cerebellum. In sporadic cases of Alzheimer's disease, there can be A-beta deposition in the cerebellum, but it's usually patchy and fairly minimal. Uh, and the other important protein, of course, is tau. And this is a low-power low view of the hippocampus stained with an antibody to tau, showing, again, an abundance of immunoreactive neurofibrillary tangles in the pyramidal cell layer and the parahippocampal region. And here they are at a high magnification. The tau antibodies stay, uh, label tangles and pretangles, um, and then neuropil threads in the background, and then senile plaques, at least the neuritic component of senile plaques as well. And that's illustrated at a higher magnification here. So uh, tangle-bearing neurons, pre-tangle-bearing neurons, and neuritic plaques, as well as the neuropil threads in the background. And the two solitudes of Alzheimer's disease are the, the A-beta. Uh, Thomas referred to this at the uh, Skeptic Cafe yesterday. The people who believe in the primacy of A-beta protein and the individuals who believe in the primacy of tau protein, illustrated here, uh, as being causal agents of Alzheimer's disease. The most compelling evidence for A-beta being important, I think, is the genetic evidence, is that virtually all of the mutations that have been found um, in, uh, that lead to um, Alzheimer's disease all act on the A-beta synthesis machinery or cleavage machinery. 
but it is a problem that you can overexpress a beta in transgenic mouse models uh, and overexpress it as much as you like, and you really can't get classic tau pathology in the brain. You can only get tau pathology, as I understand it, by uh, looking at uh, tau mutation animals uh, and uh, looking at a tau uh, immunist tau biochemistry in those animals. And here again is a very large neuritic plaque showing an abundance of uh, phosphorylated tau and then tau in the neurofibrillary tangles. And all of this background, uh, all of this fibrillar, all of this filamentous immunoreactivity is just neuropil threads. These signals are not subtle. It's somebody with severe advanced Alzheimer's disease. This is a four panel view. These are all sections from the same individual. Um, the top two panels are hippocampus and visual cortex stained with uh, a beta 1 to 40, which is one of the antibodies that we use. I always tell our residents and fellows, you don't even need the microscope on these cases, basically, because you can actually see the signal immunoreactivity in the cortex by putting, holding the slide up to the light, and you can see the tau immunoreactivity in abundance in the cortex, in the neocortex, and in the hippocampus here as well. But of course, we still use the microscope as well. So, uh, just to sw switch gears a little bit, um, the one person who was not happy with the amyloid story in the 1980s uh, was Bob Terry, one of the legendary uh, Alzheimer researchers in the United States. He was retired now, but he still uh, is active at University of California, San Diego. Um, and what's interesting is that I might have mentioned that the two, one of the, two of the most important Alzheimer's researchers in the USA were Bob Terry. Uh, and George Glenner. Their offices were three doors apart at University of California, San Diego, and they never spoke. They never spoke and their laboratories were totally independent. They never discussed collaborative projects. Bob Terry was not satisfied that amyloid uh, explained all of the abnormalities in Alzheimer's disease, and so he hypothesized that the really key thing in Alzheimer's disease was loss of synaptic proteins and loss of synapses. And so at the time that he hypothesized this, it was a very good time because in the 1990s we had very good antibodies to synaptic proteins, especially synaptophysin, synaptotagmin, and others as well. And what he did was simply do a quantitative immunohistochemical study and showed uh, that when you quantified the immunoreactivity in the cortex using synaptophysin antibodies on archival material, you could show that although there was quite a bit of spread of the data, this is the medial frontal lobe and an inferior parietal lobe. You could show that there was a loss of synapse, synaptic proteins in Alzheimer's disease, fairly widespread in the cortex compared to the controls. Um, so he thought that the synaptic protein loss was more important than the beta amyloid. Um, it, of course, we've gone on to find out a huge amount about a beta protein, and I know other people are gonna show this slide, so I'm not gonna dwell on it in detail. Uh, just to remind you that a beta protein we now know is cleaved from the amyloid precursor protein through the sequential action of um, beta and gamma secretase. Uh, it's a partially membrane spanning protein and all of these represent known mutations in the APP gene uh, that are uh, important in the, in the pathogenesis of autosomal dominant familial Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and to me, one of the things that's extremely interesting about this is that, is that, of course, two things are interesting. One is that all of the APP mutations that lead to autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease are in the, either the A-beta domain or the A-beta flanking domain of this very large gene, the APP gene. So virtually all of the mutations are in that area. And what's even more interesting to me, because I'm interested in amyloid angiopathy, is that mutations in codon 692, 693, and 694 all cause a phenotype that is dominated by amyloid angiopathy. In fact, the codon 693 mutation is so dominated by amyloid angiopathy that they really present more with vascular disease or what looks like vascular cognitive impairment than they do with Alzheimer's disease. And the pathology there is really quite uh, remarkable. Yep. Minutes. Over. One minute. Okay. Uh, so this is actually something that is not something that I, that I do, except this is a collaborative study where we have looked at some mouse models of uh, Alzheimer's disease, looking at modifiers of A-beta deposition in the hippocampus, 
uh, but again, uh, not the kind of studies that I'm involved with all the time, but obviously it's extremely important. I just wanted to show one last slide uh, to show that we are now at a stage where we can actually image uh, beta protein, not quite so good at imaging uh, tau protein in the brain, uh, and you can actually show that in individuals with Alzheimer's disease, this is structural imaging on an Alzheimer patient showing cerebral cortical atrophy, there are huge amounts of beta amyloid deposited in the cortex. Uh, but we still don't know what all of that deposition of beta amyloid uh, means in the cortex. Uh, so, uh, but, but certainly this is one of the hottest areas of Alzheimer's disease research is to try to be able to image these ligand, image these proteins in the brain in vivo and then see what happens uh, over time. And this is going to be extremely important in treatment paradigms because if you can develop a treatment, immunotherapy or anything else to try to treat Alzheimer's disease or prevent Alzheimer's disease, it'll be very important to image the proteins uh, in the brain. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. We have time for one or two short questions. Again, there is a comorbidity exists between Alzheimer's disease and diabetes type 2. Have you looked at the brains of those patients who have both disorders and only Alzheimer. And that's a difference because diabetes brings about microcirculation yeah. damage and then we can see something different. That is a very important area and I think the changes in the diabetic brain, I agree, are probably microvessel mediated, but we haven't looked at that systematically. We have looked at microvascular contributions to cognitive impairment, but not specifically uh, in diabetics, but the, the very important. So, and other people I think will be discussing that as well. Inga. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then next presentation will be from Inga Kadish, University of Alabama, USA, and uh, she will talk about ghrelin as Alzheimer's disease modifying peptide. First, first of all, I would like to take, thank you organizers, and especially Ulrika, who is the cornerstone of everything, and I think that was her brainchild. <laughs> and, and second, but almost the same importance, for all the sponsors who made this meeting possible. And I think it is very, very important meeting, and especially because it happens here in Riga, and hopefully in the future it will bring more together local and also neuroscientists from other countries around the <coughs> world to discuss the latest achievements in neurodegenerative disease treatments. So, uh, Today, as Harry described very excellently about the pathology what Alzheimer's disease brings about to humans and all the lesions what happens in the brain, in contrast to Harry, I will talk mainly about the animal models of Alzheimer's disease because that's what I am studying. And first of all, I have to say that there, is ex there are excellent, many excellent animal models of Alzheimer's disease, but none, no single animal model is perfectly uh, picturing that processes, those processes what happens in Alzheimer patients' brains. With that knowledge, we have to understand that whatever we see in these 
mm, genetically modified animals, it's not exactly, it's sort of what we would like to study. And if we have our hypothesis that we would like to see, for example, if our modifying therapy would change either amyloid accumulation or tangle, mm, pathology changes, uh, we have to be very, caref very careful how we explain our findings in if they would be, if we would be able to bring them to the uh, humans. So overview of my, what I will talk about ghrelin and its physiological functions, what the ghrelin is, probably not many of you have heard about, then about ghrelin as a possible Alzheimer disease modifying peptide, and then briefly about our studies in aging and longevity. And this picture is from Birmingham at night, when I think the city looks the best, in my opinion. So what is ghrelin? Ghrelin is 28 amino acid or oxygenic hormone primarily produced by the stomach. Ghrelin stimulates growth hormone release and enhances feeding and weight gain to regulate energy homeostasis <clears throat> by reducing energy expenditure. And these effects mediated through activation of the growth hormone secretago receptor. Growth hormone is produced from preprogrelin uh, by um, enzyme ghrelin o acetyltransferase or GOAT. And then when it's released from stomach, the ghrelin is peptide and hormone. And when it's released from the stomach, it enters the bloodstream where it circulates in two forms, in acylated form and unacylated form. And they, according to many uh, different researchers, there is about majority of ghrelin what circulates is unacylated, and only about 30% is acylated ghrelin. And this is this acylated ghrelin what binds to the ghrelin receptors, which are majority of them are concentrated in a brain. What are the physiological functions of ghrelin? There are many. Ghrelin, first of all, stimulates um, the gut motility and acid secretion. In a pancreas, it modulates endocrine and exocrine pancreatic secretions. My interest, of course, is in the brain. And in the brain, this is a ghrelin release happens when you are hungry, that before you eat, your ghrelin levels in the blood raises, and then it uh, acts to your, um, on the receptors in your brain, and you feel hungry. And then when you eat, then the ghrelin levels go down, and, 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 and you are not hungry anymore. And also ghrelin increases food intake, increases growth hormone C secretation. In a liver, it increases glucogenesis, fatty acid synthesis, triglyceride synthesis. In fat tissue, adipose tissue, it increases adipogenesis. In a blood, in a heart, it decreases blood pressure and increases cardiac output. It modulates reproductive functions which is really important uh, feature of ghrelin actions, it decreases inflammation and also decreases inflammation in the brain and also it um, increases proliferation in cells. How the ghrelin works on central nervous system? As I told you, when it's released from stomach, it enters the blood flow and it directly, via the blood circulation, it uh, crosses blood-brain barrier and acts on hip hypothalamus in arcuate nucleus, where are NPY and aquatic-related protein um, expressing cells. And on those, there are receptors for ghrelin. And then it also indirectly and directly acts on hippocampus, because there are many already reports from ghrelin knockout and uh, ghrelin modified mice that ghrelin plays a role in cognition. 
And also, we are the central nervous system, and through the autonomic nervous system on hypothalamic pituitary endocrine axis, ghrelin regulates glucose, lipid, and energy metabolism. So here you can see from coronal sections of the mouse brain that where the ghrelin receptor mainly is expressed, here is the main hub, this is arcuate nucleus, this is hypothalamus, but also there is uh, receptor expression in hippocampus, in denti gyrus, and in CA3 and CA2, to lesser extent in CA1. So as I said, it enters bloodstream, crosses blood-brain barrier, this is arcuate nucleus, and it acts on the receptors, growth hormone receptors, and activates these cells, which releases, releases um, um, peptide release in PVN, and activates those pathways, the hunger pathways. That's why ghrelin is called the hunger hormone. That's only known exogenous hunger hormone. And opposite of that is leptin, which makes me, us feel that we are satiated. Why, one would ask, why do I care about ghrelin, which is secreted from, um, from, uh, from the stomach and guts, and why, what that has to do with Alzheimer or cognition? For cognition, I already said, started a little bit. It has been shown that growth hormone secretagoyal receptors are expressed in hippocampus where their activation enhances memory retention. And ghrelin deficient mice exhibit deficits in memory tests dependent on hippocampal function. And also high fat, high glucose diets which inhibit ghrelin secretion impair synaptic plasticity and spatial memory. More importantly, you probably have heard that caloric restriction is the only so far known intervention which increases the lifespan <coughs> in different animals, and that's been shown in many, many, many papers all over. Uh, if we would want to implement uh, caloric restriction to the humans, that's a different thought because nobody really would want to go forever for half of their life starving. That's why we are working, not only us and other people, working on caloric mimetics, meaning that we would need to find one point in all this caloric restriction pathway which we could modify perhaps with medicine to block or to uh, activate this pathway which is beneficial for longevity and cognition. And so caloric restriction which results in increase in circulating ghrelin levels improves cognition. So, and also caloric restriction as I said have been shown to improve cognition and decrease pathology in Alzheimer model mice. And because of those, we ask us a question, would ghrelin treatment, long-term treatment, prevent or delay Alzheimer's disease? And that's what we did to test our hypothesis and published in a couple of years ago in, in PLOS. And our hypothesis was, would caloric mimetic, in this case ghrelin agonist, which induce downstream caloric signals such as hunger, even in the absence of caloric restriction, may be sufficient to improve Alzheimer's disease-related cognitive de decline, meaning animals feel hungry, but they are really not calorically restricted. They just have a feeling that they are hungry. And why caloric mesmetics? As I said, caloric restriction is most robust way to extend the lifespan in rodents. 
and sirtuins and which are those pathways through which caloric restriction works, there are several. One of them is through sirtuins, and because sirtuins mediate some of the effects of caloric restriction in mammals. For example, SIRT1 in the aquatic-related peptide neurons controls the response to ghrelin and feeding behavioral caloric restri uh, restriction also decrease mTOR1 signaling, which is important uh, protein in energy, homeostasis, aging, and so forth. And also, most important, caloric restriction modulates insulin and insulin-like growth factor signaling. So for this study, what we did with Alzheimer mice, we had two months old animals. We had three group, groups of these transgenic animals. One was control, one was uh, pure caloric restriction, as been shown by other people, and one group we fed with this uh, uh, ghrelin agonist, which was donated by Ellie Lilly to us, and to induce the hunger without caloric restriction. And how we did that, we fed these ghrelin animals with the ghrelin every day, ghrelin pill, certain amount, and restricted food intake, because if we wouldn't restrict the food intake, they would eat and get fat, of course. But we gave them as much food as control group ate the day before. So, and after three months treatment, we did quantity of the magnetic resonance to see the body composition, the fat, lean mass, behavioral and cognitive testing, and biochemistry and immunohistochemistry on a brain tissue. As for body weight, as we expected, control, uh, uh, control and uh, ghrelin treatment, this is LY, ghrelin treatment group had the same body mass, however, calorically restricted, of course, has had lower one because they were calorically restricted. This is percent of body fat where you can see control and ghrelin treated were the same. As for caloric restricted, they had less. In a water maze task, um, control animals in green and uh, the learning curve was more flat. There was not a tremendous difference, but it nevertheless it was significant uh, that calorically restricted and ghrelin treatment animals perform similar, better than control uh, than control animals and that's also is shown here on the probe trial test when they have uh, they found the platform faster as for pathology this is pathology from stratum orients and denti gyrus of those mice control mice had this this amount of pathology amyloid load which is also quantified here calorically restricted and ghrelin treated animals had less significantly less amyloid beta load than control animals as for inflammation uh, these are two panels con uh, consisting of three groups. The top panel is stain for EBA or um, microglial staining, and the bottom one is GFAP or astrocyte staining. And there, uh, in the microglial staining, we saw reduction in uh, microglia Im immunoreactivity in stratum orients. In astrocyte staining, we did not see any significant. It looks, but it was not, didn't come significant. So our ghrelin treatment improved in these animals, improved learning and memory in these mice, and also in, um, lessened the inflammatory changes in the brain. Based on this and some other previous results, uh, we hypothesized that animals randomized to induced chronic hunger would live longer even without objective caloric restriction. And we were lucky to get this highly <laughs> controversial grant uh, and the rationale for this grant was that ghrelin, a gut hormone, via hypothalamic circuits 
is involved in hunger and meal initiation causing perceived negative energy balance even in eucaloric conditions. The grant was based on that, that lots of things could happen in aging only because we think differently. And it's been shown in flies, in mice. For example, if one group of flies are fed with high caloric diet, another group of flies are there but divided, they never get that high caloric diet, they just smell it and they think they eat high caloric diet. They also get some, uh, I don't work with flies, but that was publication. Uh, they also get obese or as they model diabetic phenotype, just by perceiving. And in our case, we thought just by perceiving the caloric restriction or hunger, we would activate certain pathways in the brain which are responsible for better cognitive performance and less age-related pathology. So for that study, we had longevity studies where you put the mice either control or ghrelin treatment for the rest of their life, from two months of age till when the last one of them dies. And then you see if the ghrelin treated animals lived longer or not. That group is now been for 24 months fed. And they're, they're still living, we are not finished with them, some of them still living. And there is for now 50% more animals living in ghrelin treatment group than in control. We were shocked about that and we don't know how to explain. That's why we have time point studies and that was done on C57 or wild type mice. And time point studies was also on C57 and we set them at year and two year time points to do the cognitive, uh, behavioral uh, and uh, all the other biochemical um, body composition, glucose tolerance, and all those, and harvest the results. And also, the third group was the SAMP8 and SAMR1 mice. Uh, these are models for aging. SAMP8 mice are not transgenic mice, but they are inbred for many generations with the traits, many traits, what uh, induce faster aging. They die somewhere around 15 months of age, something like that. And we, the studi study design was the same. And outcome measures for this study, body weight, body composition, food consumption, behavioral, cognitive, microbiome, metabolite analysis in the brain and feces, energy expenditure, that is calorimetry, activity, drinking, feeding, and tissue and blood samples. And all this study is still ongoing. The SAMP mice are uh, already sacrificed. How much I have? Five minutes? Thank you. Uh, sacrificed, and those, as you can see, the red ones are SAMP8. Why there are four groups? Because SAMP8 are fast aging, and SAMP are ones are controls for these SAMP8. When you have some mice strain, what you want to test in any treatment, you have to have a proper control. And this SAMP R1 is a proper control. It's the same genotype, it's everything the same. They only live normal lifespan. And as you see, the body weights really did not differ significantly throughout this period. And food consumption, you can see there is only two graphs, both for both genotypes SAMP8 and SAMR1, because the other ghrelin groups were fed the same amount of the control groups. Body composition also did not differ, neither fat or lean mass between the groups. In zero maze test that would measure anxiety, there were differences between the genotypes. Some are one mice spend a much more time in a closed arms than open, and some eight mice about equally in open or closed, but there were no effect of treatment. In object recognition, <clears throat> some are one mice, which are control mice. 
the ghrelin treated group spent more time with new object. However, in a SAMP8 or real aging mice, there was no difference. Perhaps to, at that time, they were already that demented that they could not improve. We did not see any improvement. In water maze, there were no difference between treatment and control groups. There were difference between genotypes and the same thing in probe trials. However, when we put them in clam cages or caloric, where you do the caloric measurements, where you do uh, activity, energy expenditure, feeding paradigms, you put in a cages and everything is measured there. Then what you see here are the representations of ac activity actograms for some weight over 24 hours, light and dark circle uh, cycle. And this is for some R1 mice and SAMP8 mice. And this is controlled, this is ghrelin treated. As you see, the activity, let's say in a dark cycle, in some mice, control on ghrelin is about the same. However, in SAMP8 mice, they have fragmented activity. Mice are nocturnal animals. They are more active at night than in day. And here, usually mice have more activity at the beginning of the dark cycle, and then they a little bit go sleep, and then just before uh, the daylight or the switch of the animal <laughs> people when they switch the light they are again a little bit eating but in some eight mice they they had fragmented activity and ghrelin treatment actually prevented this fragmentation and returned the activity pattern more to the sam r1 some R1 mice, which are controls. The same, here you can see activity uh, in both genotypes in a dark and light cycle, and same happened with the feeding, of course. Their feeding, SAMP8 feeding was fragmented, and the acti like activity and ghrelin treatment prevented that. It kind of more returned to the control mice. Also in RER, respiratory exchange ratio, you can see the pattern of SAMR1 mice and SAM8 mice has a fragmented pattern. And from that, we can conclude that metabolism is biphasic in SAMP8 mite, likely secondary to the feeding patterns. And ghrelin treatment prevented this biphasic pattern. And as the same goes for energy expenditure, also the fragmented pattern. And it's also been shown in Alzheimer's disease patients, the activity or their circadian rhythm is disturbed. And that happens also in these aging mice. And ghrelin treatment prevented this fragmentation and returned their circadian rhythm uh, in a proper pattern which may, may, at the end, also improve cognition via metabolic pathways. And for that, we are starting new uh, studies where we will be looking especially at the clock gene expression in different tissues, not only in the master clock, which is in brain, but also in peripheral tissues. So also we looked in metabolites with, met, uh, with the company Metabolon, which looks for 300 something metabolites looked in a brain tissue and in feces. And what we found, the key differences in the brain, that were um, altered with ghrelin treatment was altered serine, theorine, and glycine metabolism, antioxidant and inflammation biomarkers, and tryptophan chain was altered. And in feces, there were uh, differences in free fatty acids, uh, what would also point to the diet, nutrient absorption, and also some microbiome marker. 
And summary so far, this is ongoing study where we just now collecting the results from these time point studies and collected all the vast majority of tissues. And so, so summary so far for these SAMP8 mice only, six months of ghrelin treatment agonist did not alter the body composition and cognition was significantly improved in ghrelin treated SAMR1 but not SAMP8 mice. And in 12-12 like dark cycle, both SAMR1 and SAMP8 mice exhibited typical 24-hour rhythmicity, in general cage activity, respiratory exchange ratio, and energy expenditure. However, SAMP8 mice exhibited pronounced ultra day and rhythms in all measurements and ghrelin treatment in these SAMP8 mice eliminated the ultra-DN phenotype and restored the amplitude of 24-hour rhythms. And here is just one of the last slides where I wanted to say preliminary from 12 months and 24 months C57 studies which shows that in learning curves, there is really no difference after ghrelin treatment for a year or two years. But what we were surprised in eight arm water maze, pro, that was eight arm water maze, in a probe trial, they did, ghrelin treated animals did find the correct platform position correctly. That was, that was pleasant surprise. And with that, I would like to finish and acknowledge all the people, all my students who did the work, all my collaborators and the team members, and also my funding agency, and Ellie Lilly for kindly donating the Grelin Agonist. Thank you. Thank you. So are there questions about the topic? I see two questions. So With the ghrelin experiments, you had a decrease in uh, inflammation with microglial markers and decrease in A-beta. Do you think those were independent effects or do you think it's just the lower amount of A-beta was associated with lower microglial activity? Those are things that are really hard to explain. We had, because those mice, they have a lots of uh, CAA and that CAA was decreased in the blood vessels and because of that or in, because of lessened my, uh, microglia activity and probably due to that the blood flow was increased also because one of my pet subjects and what I really believe is whatever will improve the blood flow, blood vessel quality in your brain will improve the cognitive aspects of the disease and also perhaps pathology. That that is, that is in my other part, what I'm doing in studies. This is different. But in, indirectly, I think lots of treatments which will improve the blood flow through the brain will improve the cognition. Thank you. Professor Kulsha. Do you hear? Oh, yeah. uh, thank you for your intriguing data. Uh, my question, what's happened in the brain during six months treatment with ghrelin? What's happened with other anorexigenic and or exigenic compounds, particularly melanocortins and, um, and um, orexins and NPY and so on and so Melanocortin we are going to measure in tissues. We measure ghrelin level. We thought we were concerned about desensitization of the receptors because it's really long treatment. For our surprise, when we measure the ghrelin levels in these ghrelin treated animals, the ghrelin levels in those, we thought also the ghrelin levels because if we give more ghrelin, we thought there will be less production of the ghrelin or this is the sensitization of the ghrelin receptors. It did not happen. They actually had more ghrelin and we 
as I said, we are now just trying to figure out what happened. We are staining our, with immunohistochemistry, our brains to see the different nucleus, what happened there, and also analyzing biochemist with biochemistry what happened with different hormones and with different peptides and in the brain. We don't know how it exactly. That's where comes our mechanistic, mechanistical studies to find out how exactly that co beneficial cognitive effect was achieved. Perhaps it's not one pathway, but several pathways. We are focusing on mTOR pathway and insulin sensitivity. Because insulin sensitivity and and, and glucose tolerance, all those measurements we did, and they are improved in ghrelin-treated animals. Now it's all just a correlation. We are going deeper to find through which of those mechanisms, through CIRT1 or through mTOR, or perhaps more than one pathway is involved. So, thank you. Thank you. And uh, good luck with uh, going on with your studies. And then And with that, I will introduce our next speaker, Jens Spanke from Norway, from the University of Oslo. Even actually, he is working in several other places at the same time. Close it up. So we have to connect a bit. So I'm going to talk today about dementia and depression and possibilities of treatment of dementia using antidepressive drugs. And um, this is something which is actually very new. And I will start with the story which we started about 15 years ago and the discoveries we made during that time uh, after a short introduction because that is something that I would like to show you first. So we are working on different topics, and I will use this pointer here, I think it's better to see. We work on vascular factors of dementia, brain barrier transporters. This is our main goal in research. We look for new treatments. We have a look for the etiology of sporadic diseases as one of the center investigations and modifiers of inherited diseases. And on the clinical side, we're working on neuropathological diagnostics and treatment studies with patients and the development of markers. And the final part we started with, uh, just by accident actually, is depression and Alzheimer's disease as a link. We had... Perfect. Very nice. Thank you very much. So what we, what we did the last years is actually set up a scheme for our hypothesis. And this scheme, we went through the last years with experiments to prove that. In the center we have the blood-brain barrier, the vessels, the Curie plexus, and the ABC transporters. And these are hampered, so to say, in cerebral diseases of a protein deposition. So if you have a problem with the clearance of amyloid and amyloid degradation, you accumulate those amyloid oligomeres and peptides, and that leads to deposition, forming of plaques, and certain diseases. And the hypothesis at that time was we, this leads to Alzheimer's disease. On the other hand, we have aging and functional mitochondrial alteration that lead to differences in the function of ABC transporter. We have nutrition, environment, and pharmaceuticals. And we know that also ABC transporters are used for stem cell homing and differentiation. So I will show you some parts of this pathway here and some of these. I will not talk about this aging and not about the stem cell stuff, uh, but it's also included and very interesting. So we have uh, a number of dementias, and Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia are actually the two most common causes of disease, and it usually comprises both in the patients. You never have a patient with a pure Alzheimer's disease that has no problems in the vasculature. And the third is the dementia with Levy bodies, um, which comprises about a quarter of all those diseases. And then we have some rare causes, which uh, we can also talk about, but not today. The problem in those diseases is that we have different cortical fields that are affected throughout the brain, and depending on the cortical field that is affected at a certain time, we have different clinical situations in the patients. 
And for the definition of a dementia, you have to have at least two cognitive functions in that row that are affected irreversibly. So if you have some problems with aphasia, so speech understanding and uh, agnosia, recognition of something, that's already a dementia even if you have no amnesia, no memory problems. For the patient, it's very important and also visoconstructive and orientation problems are very important for those and when the frontal brain is affected in the patients, the patient actually gets a severe problem, especially with their relatives, because they change the mood, they change the activity, behavior and also the sexual activity and that's one of the big problems. So this is an example for agnosia. So somebody knows what this is. That's how the people feel, so they see something. Their eyes work normally, but the brain cannot recognize what it is. And you can help a little bit, or even more. And if you don't know this, I will give you a solution. That's a giraffe in front of a window. And that's what the patients don't have, so they don't have the solution. They usually get signs like this, and they have to say what it is. And that's the second example. That's a Mexican on a bicycle. So these are very simple but these are very helpful to explain how the patient feels. So you go through the roads in Beijing, for instance, and you read all those Chinese signs and you can recognize, cannot recognize where you are. That's how the patient feels. There is something which is very important for the recent years of research in Alzheimer's disease. We have only less than 1% of the cases that actually are comprised by known genetics, the familiar forms. We have mutations in free genes, we have some protective APP mutations, but no tau mutations however. We have, on the other hand, 99% of all the Alzheimer's disease patients that have no mutations in any of those genes. There are some risk factors like the APOE uh, epsilon 4 allele that is known to increase the risk by 100%, so from, uh, four, uh, from 12 to 24% if you have an epsilon 4 allele. But that's all the only. There is no other mutation known so far. All the mouse models that have been generated, or most of the mouse models that have been generated, have mutations from those families. So actually the research which was driven the last 20, 25 years was done with mice or mouse models of a rare disease. If you apply for money getting funded for familiar Alzheimer's disease in the EU, you can apply for rare disease funding because it is in the list of rare diseases. It's only these few cases, actually. So that's a big problem. So the mouse models are actually not comprising what we have in the, most, well, in the patients. And this is the protein of problem. This is the APP molecule, and this red small part is the A-beta cleaved part, and it's cleaved from the stapyotein in a way that we have two enzymes, and these two enzymes generate a small peptide, and this small peptide may aggregate to oligomers and later form plaques. And during the last years, or recent years, it came more clear that the plaques which Alois Alzheimer's uh, saw in his um, patient uh, are not actually the biggest problem. The problem are those uh, soluble oligomers that flow through the brain and cause severe harm to the brain. Um, the discussion is ongoing since it's a big problem to measure actually the oligomers and it's also very difficult to establish uh, precise forms of these oligomers for research. Uh, there are some un antibodies on the market to recognize those but none actually work properly. In Alzheimer's disease and also in other diseases, we usually have a um, cause of the disease that starts at a certain location and then it pops up in different other locations. Here for instance it starts in the temporal lobe of memory and cognition problems goes on to the frontal lobe of behavioral problem and finally it ends up in the occipital lobe which causes syndromes like we call it Capgras syndrome where you have evil neighbors, hallucinations and things like that. The risk factors are very important and the biggest risk factor as we heard yesterday is already in age and also mother with Alzheimer's disease is very important and the link with mother with Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease is the genetics of mitochondria actually. So there are possibilities that you have certain mitochondrial constitutions, genetic differences, very slight differences that lead to differences in the ATP production, which are normally not a problem, but over 20, 30 years these cause some problem. Now, this is something we published already. Of course, mutations, and then we have some putative risk factors, also the degree of education. Inga has been talking about that yesterday already. And there is one link between these and these. The function of the mitochondria, the activity of the mitochondria in your brain, and the delivery of energy, and your possibility to be able to learn something and also make connections and new connections in the brain is something which is very interesting. 
There are also some protective factors. If you take diclofenac or ibuprofen before start of the disease, it is said to help, so that's already very interesting. After the start of the disease, it doesn't help anymore, but nobody knows really how this comes and uh, whether it's really suitable to treat patients, because ibuprofen, you can buy it in the pharmacy, wrecks your kidneys very nicely and very easily. Coffee consumption is inversely correlated also with red wine consumption. Uh, using red wine, you can treat cells or animals and protect from neurotoxicity, but you have to be careful that you take moderate amounts and you have to have a special grape, Cabernet Sauvignon. And it turned out that this study actually was funded by the Italian wine industry, so you never know. So at least you know the Mediterranean diet, olive oil and red wine is quite helpful for the vessels and as soon as you have no vessel problems, you will have no problems with dementia. So what do we see in the brain? We have some of those hallmarks. Um, Harry already showed some of these. Uh, this is what is especially interesting is this circumscribed vessel which has a lot of amyloid around the vessel. This is actually our target in research. So this is microglia. The microglia try to get rid of those plugs so they are very active but up to a certain time point. If the plugs get older and the patient gets older, here it's a mouse, these microglia are shut off. They are not active anymore. If you reactivate them in an older age, you cause severe problems with encephalitis. And in those studies where it was used to reactivate the immune system to treat Alzheimer's disease, they had severe problems. About 7 to 8 percent of patients had encephalitis. That's also a mouse model where you see nicely the plaques at those vessels. It's the APP23 model. Now it's a question, what is actually the mechanism that underlies sporadic Alzheimer's disease? So we have no genetic mechanisms. We know that there is plaques, we know that there is amyloid in the brain, but what is the mechanism? What is the problem of that? So we have some possibilities to treat. And the hypothesis to treat Alzheimer's disease during the last years was that this pathway is enhanced in patients. So we have an overproduction of amyloid, but that is totally wrong. There is no overproduction of amyloid, and that was proven multiple times now, even in vivo in patients. Uh, so you, what you could do is, if you have an overproduction, that was the hypothesis, you can inhibit the protein synthesis, the peptide cleavage, and things like that, or you can activate the clearance. And the most recent studies uh, didn't work properly. You can also try to use some of those drugs that have been uh, introduced into treatment. We have been talking about this green tea yesterday already and ginkgo biloba, but none of those actually work very nicely. There is only one drug, this is memantine, that helps a little bit in the setting that a patient uses more of its brain uh, when the brain is deficient. They need more areas of the brain to fulfill a certain task and to suppress this overuse at a certain time. You can use memantine to suppress it, but it's not in all patients that it works actually. So these immunological studies, and here's just two examples where halted. In phase three, there is no benefit so far in patients. So the question is, if we have no overproduction and all those things didn't work, can we use a different way of clearance? Can we get rid of this? And now the sun's come up because now the topic starts interesting. So what is done in the studies? In the studies it was done that the plaques were reduced due to the treatment, but for the sake of generating those toxic oligomers. And this is a big problem. So you generate actually toxicity by removing plaques. So plaque treatment or direct treatment of plaques is not the way to do it. It's much better to get rid of these here and then having a floating equilibrium from here to here. So the degradation and the excretion of those oligomers and monomers are actually the problem. I've, been, I've written a report about that that was um, 2009 explaining why it doesn't work and what we could do and the hypothesis underlying, this is this small film. So we have the brain, we have neurons in the brain, we have also vessels in the brain, and there is a certain amount or a certain kind of proteins in the brain that is very well known in cancer treatment, but not with respect to neurodegenerative diseases. We have these transport molecules, that's just the scheme uh, with a transmembrane uh, uh, transporter here, it's only located on one of those sites, but these transporters are very important. These transporters excrete, or these carriers excrete, metabolites from the brain actively into the bloodstream by using ATP. Uh, these so-called ATP are binding cassette transporters or ABC transporters. 
And they are known from cancer therapy that ABC transporters are upregulated in cancer cells that are resistant to chemotherapy. So these transporters are used in the cancer cell to prevent the treatment actually. But here it would be nice to know is there any transporter involved in the disease. And we started that a few years ago and actually it was just a lucky incident that we I got this idea of 17 years ago to work with those because we were working together with uh, people from the pharmaceutical department, pharmacology department nearby, having a look for rifampicin in the intestine. So the hypothesis at that time raised that if some of those transporters, and we didn't know, have lower kinetic uh, function or are even missing or mutated, you have a problem and you store peptides metabolites in the brain and you cannot get rid of them anymore. And if there is a function to a certain extent minimized only, it takes a long time to accumulate because the production is very low. A beta production is very low, is not very high. So this is an overview. We have 49 of those transporters in the body. And some of those transporters, if they are mutated, cause severe diseases like mucoviscidosis. It's a lung disease where you cannot um, excrete um, chloride ions properly. And there was a first paper about this in 2001 about a beta efflux that is mediated by p glycoprotein. At that time, we started to have a look in autopsy material and we found that in those regions in the brain of old patients without dementia, where the transporter is very active, and this is a vessel here, the bigger and the smaller part, and then you don't see any amyloid deposits or less. And in those regions where you have no expression or low expression, you have amyloid deposits. So there was an inverse correlation, not just between the brains of different patients, but even within the brain at certain locations. And that was the first thing. Then we started to do some experiments in mice to prove this hypothesis experimentally. So we used mouse cells, cultivated mouse cells, to see the transport via the barrier. And we used knockout lines to see is there a difference in the transport. And yes, indeed, this is a normal mouse, black six, and this is a um, FVB mouse. This is a mouse which lacks the transporter, and this also lacks the transporter. And you see the transport is reduced if you lack the transporter. And what was also interesting is that these transporters are expressed at different locations. So at the brain capillaries, you have more ABC B1, and if the uh, COE plexus, you have more ABC C1. So that's also very interesting because this can tell you something about location specificity. So we set up a lot of mice at that time, and this slide actually is quite old. And the final group of mice, this will just come up in brain with a publication soon. It's accepted already, and we just get, wait for the proof to come. About those mice, this is a new model for sporadic Alzheimer's disease or spor early sporadic Alzheimer's disease without any transgene. Uh, but I will talk about those mice and give you some idea about these. And you see this bar here only, this is what is interesting. You see this is a control AD mouse, so to say, a amyloidosis mouse. This is a mouse that lacks the transporter G2, there is no change. And this is a mouse or a group of mice that lack the transporter B1 and they have an increase of 3.5 to 4 fold in the amount of A beta in the brain. And this is one of the fractions we, of course, analyzed more. And if you lack this transporter, and this was actually meant to be a control during that study, if this is missing, you have 12 to 14 fold increase of amyloid in the brain. So if this transporter is not working properly at the blood brain barrier, you have a severe problem. You store amyloid in the brain. And at the same time, we had our paper in this journal for revision and it was then rejected because a nice colleague didn't want to have it from Munich. This paper came out by Randall Bateman and David Holzman and they did studies in patients stating that the clearance is reduced by 28% in age-matched control versus Alzheimer's disease patients using radioactive a beta. And that was very interesting for us, and we wanted to know, oh, can we modulate somehow, because this is elderly patients, how much reduction do we need to store a beta in the brain? And we set up a mathematical model with 56 differential equations. And we found that in our model, reducing the export capacity by only 11%, it predicts a fourfold increase in the amount of soluble A beta in the brain. And 11% for everybody who does Western blots or other biological measurements and investigations knows 11% is within the, usually the standard deviation. So the reduction of the function at the blood brain barrier doesn't need to be very high to cause storage already in the brain. 
And we have lots of capillaries in the brain. So these transporters are influenced by inhibitors and inductors and also the size and the charge of a peptide is important for the transport capacity and the kinetics of these transporters. And just one explanation because uh, since long it is discussed why is Dutch type A beta deposited at the vessels, mainly at the vessels, and later forms plugs, but primarily at the vessels. So we have the late, so to call late CAA and elderly, which have plugs and then also get some vascular amyloid, and we have this Dutch type form. In the Dutch type form, it was said that the alpha secretase cleavage is causing problem. Uh, but it isn't. Actually, it's a shift ch of the charge in the middle of this peptide. And this charge shift, we, hypo we hypothesized, leads to a problem in the transport. And we used mice to check this. And it was very interesting. These mice form vascular deposits after two years. If you take a transporter out, they have a severe problem because lots of those animals, more than 80%, actually die at an early stage, 100 to 175 days. And first we were wondering about this problem because we didn't recognize that it could be actually the experiment already. We thought the animals are sick or we have some problems in the mouse house. What you see is a huge amount of storage of amyloid within those neurons. And they get epileptic seizures and they actually finally die uh, in a state of a status epilepticus sometimes as you find it in Down syndrome's patients. Down syndrome's patients have the same problem if they get to an age um, of 80. So two minutes left. I just jump over something like this. So what we did then is we tried to activate the transporters and it works very nicely. So the activation of those transporters leads uh, to treatment possibilities. And now we come to the uh, dementia depression part, which is very important. Because we wanted to have more activators. And it was difficult to find activators for these transporters because the pharmaceutical industry is developing inhibitors because of this cancer treatment. So we were looking in plants. And at that time, there was also a paper coming up, 2014 now, that amyloid imaging in depression is a predictor of Alzheimer's disease. And that's the question. We know that SSRIs, which are used for treatment like citalopram, have only very little effects in elderly. Nobody really knows why it doesn't work properly. And there is other, there is other drugs like Sanchon's word extract which work much, much nicer in elderly. And the question is, what is the mechanism underlying this? There is another paper saying that antidepressant decreases a beta production, but this study used citalopram, which actually doesn't work very nicely in patients, but it shows that there is some decrease of a beta if you use this. So that's why we went for plants. We had a look what type of plants are interesting and can activate a transport. So here are some of those. We also tested green tea and several uh, extractions to see whether there is a function with it. And we came along this hypericum perforatum. That will be the last part uh, of my talk. This hypericum perforatum is a plant. When you extract it, you can use it as a drug in Germany. It's legally advised and you can, it's also used uh, by doctors to treat depression. And if you use extraction of St. John's word, special extractions like these 80% ethanolic extraction, you can nicely reduce the amyloid, the soluble and also the plaque amount in animals. You can reconstitute the amount of neurons and you have a nice improvement in those mice with the cognition. That's the water maze testing here. And we were very lucky because this drug is available with the name LIFE 900 and is licensed and approved in Germany, you can just use it for patients. So you don't have to go through big ethical approvals. We have a law in Germany that if there is a medication on the market, you can use it as a treatment trial in a single patient if you want to heal a patient. And that is the last slide you know. So we used this drug in mice and also in patients already and we found that in mice it nicely enhanced it as I showed you um, the activation of ABCC1 and it removes amyloid from the brain. And also in patients, it works very nicely. You can use it for the treatment of patients. And after six to eight weeks, you have the improvement by six to nine months in the clinical situation of the patient. Then you stabilize the patients over two years now. So that's a possibility. So that's very interesting. So we go actually for plant research. We publish this and that's how it looks like. Looking for different varieties of these plants, growing these, and then extracting these and have a look 
what can we do with those plants uh, and define actually the extracts that define the ingredients that do the job. This wouldn't have been possible all with lots of support from different groups all over the world and also of the group, this is the photograph from Magdeburg. I have to say thank you for your interest and thank you also to the organizers for organizing this nice meeting and to the group who helped me with that work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we start to be late, so one question and the rest for the for the discussions. Okay, Professor Kulsha. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is: Do you, do you know uh, idea or some data about full lengths and um, amino acid sequence of ABC transporter protein? And are there any data that this um, uh, about fragments of this transporter protein? Maybe they are also active. Shorter fragment, I mean. You mean the, 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 um, the transporter itself? Yeah. The transporter. the transporter, these proteins are really huge and you have to have the full transporter that the transporter is active. But of course it can transport parts of A-beta as well, so smaller fragments of A-beta. Uh, we actually currently investigate in possibilities to having smaller peptides transport and what is the difference if you have a lack of uh, these transporters in brains uh, with regard to smaller moieties or smaller fragments of A-beta in the constituent in the brain. So it is, uh, there's nothing known yet about it. So you can, you can measure it, but it's not done yet. Thank you. Next talk uh, will be uh, Alexander Zharkovsky from Tartu University, Sporter. Estonia. And he will talk about new challenges with all drugs. Uh, asking question if memantine in combination with melatonin affects disease progression in the animal models of Alzheimer's brain. Thank you very much. Uh, dear chair, lady, chairman, colleagues, friends, as previous speakers, I want to say thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting and giving opportunity to talk with you. And uh, it's a funny. Uh, when I was a student, medical student, my first research project, what was given to me was just related to memantine action. Now past many, many years, I am almost retiring, and now I came back to the same drug and want to talk about that. So, uh, as many previous speakers uh, already told, that Alzheimer's disease is a disaster. It is a disaster for patients, it's a disaster for families and for the society. And uh, somehow we are living longer, and uh, the ch chance to get an Alzheimer's disease is uh, growing up. At least my wife tells me my, uh, uh, you know, gross performance in homework is declining. And then I think maybe in a couple of years I have to take a treatment to improve this performance. And, uh, each patient, each patient costs a lot of money each year. And the society have to pay, has to pay for the care, what we offer for those patients. And this is a, from the United States, probably taken figures which show us that just, no, average is $50,000 per year we have to spend for each patient. And if we start to think, what is important? Uh, if patient has a developed Alzheimer's, we have little to do. Uh, 
the brain lost synaptic contacts, then reads, we can't restore very much the brain functions. But if we think, if we try to delay the onset of the disease by, let's say, three months, six months, or if we are very happy, by one year, we can benefit a lot. But if we come back to the treatment, available treatments, what do we have really? The major, the first line drugs which are being used is just acetylcholine, uh, choline esterase inhibitors. Currently, we are using free inhibitors, and I would say that people suffer a lot. Tolerability of choline esterase inhibitors is low. The number of side effects is huge, and many times we just can't use them in many patients just because of side effects. Then comes second line drug. If people do not tolerate choline esterase inhibitors, then memantine is given. Uh, memantine is also not very good. At least neither choline esterase inhibitors and memantine are effective at the beginning of the disease. We don't see any benefit using those drugs at the beginning of the disease. So, uh, only in moderate cases, we see some better performance, gross performance in those patients, but we are not talk talking about memory and learning. It's not affected. If they lost memory, they lost memory but performance a little bit better when we see moderate severity of the Alzheimer's disease. So, so many hopes are uh, going to disease-modifying drugs, and we have several ways uh, for uh, development of those which could stop the progression. The first line is just drug interfering with with the amyloid aggregation. It means that we can change the processing of APP toward non-amyloidogenic peptides. Then the next approach is just to lower this toxic peptide, alpha beta, uh, 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 beta amyloid here. Yeah? And this is also many attempts. And then immunotherapy. Uh, active immunization and then use of antibodies. But we see several clinical trials are going on with those therapies and we still hope for them. But if we look how many trials have been failed, uh, this is minus is show us those unsuccessful trials. And it's very devastating that we fail at the phase to be or even free, when we spend a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of work, and finally we get nothing. So, but we still hope, and there are coming new and new modern therapies, and maybe we, it, we, they will succeed. Uh, okay, I go further. And now coming back to Miamantin. We have, what do we have? We have common esterase inhibitors and we have memantine. And the sales of memantine are huge. 1.8 billion per year, it's sold to the Alzheimer's patients just to help them somehow. But only small positive effect on cognition. Just performance and slightly improved. Uh, sorry. Uh, and so what is important? We don't see efficacy of memantine at the onset of disease. We can't induce a delay in the onset of this disease using memantine, and we can't improve. Uh, well, what about melatonin? It has been proven in several animal studies. 
It has been proven in several clinical trials. But the reason to use memantine was just to improve sleep disturbances. Because Alzheimer patients have disturbed sleep, rhythms are changed, they have depression, and so on and so on. And then memantine has been added as an option to improve this circadian rhythm. But in all those trials, melatonin was used in quite low doses. Because people are very afraid. It's a number of side effects which have been reported with regard of melatonin. And when we started to work with melatonin and try to see any report on the side effects, on the toxicity of melatonin, we couldn't find anything. It's just public opinion based on theoretical considerations. But there is no real studies with regard of safety of melatonin. OK, uh, coming back. Several years ago, we just usually working on cells and looking for neuroprotectants, we used memantine as a positive control. It always wor works. It is a neuroprotectant. It's an MDA receptor antagonist. And we use it as a, just to check whether system is working. And then we added melatonin to these uh, cultures and uh, just tasted melatonin plus memantine. To our surprise, we, we got a very nice neuroprotection. It's OK. Uh, uh, it was not very exciting, but we saw that melatonin itself when we test it. It has a very low efficacy. It's not good neuroprotectant, and we saw some uh, you know, neuroprotective effect after 60 micromolar of melatonin. But in all cases, when we added melatonin to memantine, we got enhancement of the effects of memantine. Uh, Later on, we worked on one project when we tested the toxicity of peptides which have been derived from uh, amyloid, 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 this transmembrane domain. Uh, and we tested peptides which bear muta London mutation in APP and we wanted to see whether those fragments are more toxic or less toxic to neuronal cells. And there have been several peptides been generated. Some of them have been bearing this mutation, and some of them not, but they, we use them as a control peptides. Different mutations have been done. And we saw that those peptides which bear London mutation been much more toxic than other control peptides. And we use this peptide in it just to show how toxic they are. This is another peptide which also has London mutation, also was toxic. Some other peptides which have other mutation were not toxic. So, and we tested in our neuronal lines this combination uh, of memantine and melatonin and added this toxic peptide with London mutation. We got almost the same neuroprotective results. This combination was working. Melatonin itself, you see, very low activity. But when we add melatonin to memantine, use this combination, it was highly neuroprotective. This work was done on PC12. So. Then we came to animal models. I am not very optimistic with regard of whole models for Alzheimer's disease. Really, we don't have any real model of Alzheimer's. It's just uh, nothing to do, but we have to use something what we 
have. And then we used, and just we injected a toxic fragment of beta amyloid 25 to 35 amino acids. It makes aggregates. If we inject ICV, we get death, and we test and drugs on this model. It's absolutely not a model of Alzheimer's disease, but it's still something what we have. And we gave combination of memantin and melatonin for eight days, and then we tested this episodic memory. It, we've been talking about that before lectures. It's a very nice method for the memory, for the recognition, and it's impaired, always impaired in Alzheimer's patients. Okay, we looked at this model, and then we tested this, our combination. We got an improvement in this memory test, and then we looked at the uh, toxicity of this fragment. And I would say that we counted pycnotic cells in CA1 region of the hippocampus, and we see all this so enhancement of the effect of memory. Once again, melatonin given alone was not active in this model. And to prove that, we counted cells. Uh, we did the same experiment using only melatonin, one milli three milligram per kilogram, six milligram per kilogram. We counted the cells. We didn't see any effect on the toxic fragment of beta amyloid. There was no neuroprotection. Uh, putting both, both we saw. Uh, next, we look at the, this horrible model of amyloidosis with five mutations, uh, human mutations. We have been found so far, uh, three mutations being inserted in APP gene and two mutations in preselin one gene, which have been described. And those animals bearing five mutations, uh, they have amyloidosis already at the age of two months. But what I would say, those mice, at that age, when we see amyloid plaques, they do not have much memory disturbance. We don't see loss of synaptic proteins. It's just amyloidosis. But the leading hypothesis in Alzheimer's disease is just loss of synaptic contacts, axonopathic changes, just because of accumulation of homodiamers or oligodiamers in axons, which disturb energy supply and so on. But anyway, we use this model. Uh, of course, uh, we stain with Congo red, and we see, for example, huge load of beta amyloid plaques. We tested first against this endpoint, our combination, and we saw also reduction in beta amyloid plaques. We took animals at age when they aggregate starts to come, age of two months, and gave this combination for one month per os, per oral administration, and then we see uh, that less beta amyloid. Another pathology, what we see in the brains of these animals, it's a huge inflammatory reaction. Uh, if we look at the marker for microglial activation, we, we see huge load of activated microglia. And of course, we looked at this. And then, what is the next? We see a lot of CD45 positive cells in the brain of those animals, which shows us 
clear cut inflammation. And then we looked at the inflammatory component. Could we affect this inflammation? And it was really surprising. Uh, mel uh, memantine itself was quite weak. Melatonin didn't work, but combination worked. We had a reduction in inflammatory response. The same was with another marker, CD45, we have reduced. It means that melatonin plays somehow permissive role. It enhances the effect of uh, memantine. What the mechanism? We need some mechanistic explanation for that. As we know, amyloid Precursor protein, APP, could be processed via amyloidogenic pathway and not amyloidogenic pathway. Many treatments are being under development aiming to enhance a non-amyloidogenic pathway. In this pathway, several proteolytic enzymes play a role and recently just came a paper showing that melatonin is able to enhance this non-amyloidogenic pathway via melatonin receptors interacting with ADAM, prote proteases which are involved in this pathway. It gives me just a hope that probably melatonin converts this uh, degradation pathway to our more favorable pathway. So, what will be the next? What should be the next? Of course, it is, we don't have much time, and we should try to test this combination in our patient. But what is very important? Important to get information about safety profile of this combination. To do that, we have to get a partner, industrial partner, who would be interested in manufacturing of these compounds or medications. We finally, we got it, and now we are preparing for uh, safety studies to check whether this supra, supraphysiological doses of melatonin could be safe in our in just preclinical studies before we start to go to clinical trials. And uh, what we do now is just these two kinds of, of preparation studies. And finally, I want to thank my colleagues who contributed to this work, uh, Aveli, hard-working student, she's still a student, and then Anu, Monica, and Max Sapolsky, who was also our collaborator in this project. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for a nice story. So, any questions? This is similar to the question I asked Inga. In the five times FAD uh, mice, where there's a huge amount of microglial activation, there must be many processes going on in the brain. I would think there's neuron loss, amyloid deposition. There, the animals are probably seizing, which can induce microglial activation. What do you think is the, is the cause of the microglial activation? It's a not a simple question, because, you know, Many people think that this is a part of this neuroinflammatory component which accompany Alzheimer's disease. I would say, in my own opinion, we put the human protein into the brain. And then brain reacts as a foreign protein with a huge inflammatory reaction. But just, you know, without mechanical explanations, yeah, we can think about it. If we suppress somehow, but melatonin 
is able, at least in different experiments, has anti-inflammatory component. Maybe we can modify the onset of this disease. But the problem is, I calculated the dose of melatonin which should be used in humans aiming to just suppress. It should be about 30 milligrams. And then safety issues coming to that. Yeah. We have to prove that it's not it's safe enough. Thank you. Are there any questions before I give word to Ulrika? Who has probably information about the lunch? So thank you. And with this, we conclude our session, the first one. But next sessions will follow with more interesting stories. Thank you again. Yes, thank you for the excellent talks. And now we have 15 minutes for the lunch break, and I want to inform that the speakers and organizers have received coupons, and everyone else is in the caloric, um, caloric restriction group. But the good thing is that we have uh, the preventive coffee uh, against Alzheimer's disease just next door, and you are also invited if, uh, want, if you want to eat, you can come downstairs, there is the cafeteria daily. So 15 minutes, please be back um, at one for the session uh, two, session, second session. So see you later.